Today, I'd like to talk to you about the end of fear and read you just a portion from Luke chapter 2, verse 10, where it simply says, And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For this Christmas, I want to read to you a short portion from a sermon by Charles Spurgeon, that great preacher of Victorian England. The sermon was titled, God Incarnate, the End of Fear. And in this message, Spurgeon explained how the coming of Jesus means that God answers all of our fears. As I mentioned before, Charles Spurgeon was the most famous and well-heard preacher of Victorian England more than a hundred years ago. His explanations and applications of Bible texts still speak to us today, though sometimes the modern reader must become accustomed to the Victorian manner of speaking and writing. So let me read to you this section from Charles Spurgeon, The End of Fear. According to the text, they were not to be afraid. First of all, because the angel had come to bring them good news. What does it say? It says, I bring you good news of great joy. But what was this gospel? Further on, we are told that the gospel was the fact that Christ was born. So then, it is good news to men that Christ is born, that God has come down and taken manhood into union with himself. Truly, this is good news. He who made the heavens sleeps in a manger. What does that mean? Why, it means that God is not necessarily an enemy to man, because here is God actually taking manhood into union with deity. There cannot be permanent, entrenched, immovable hatred between the two natures, or otherwise the divine nature could not have taken the human into a hypostatical union with itself. Isn't there comfort in that? You are a destitute, wicked, feeble man. And that which makes you afraid of the Lord is this fear that there is a hatred between God and man. But there need not be such animosity for your creator has actually taken manhood into union with himself. Don't you see another thought? The eternal seems to be so far away from us. He's infinite and we are such little creatures. There appears to be a great gulf fixed between man and God. He is the creator and we are the creature. But observe, he who is God has also become man. We never heard that God took the nature of angels into union with himself and may therefore say that between the Godhead and the angels, there must still be an infinite distance. But here, the Lord has actually taken manhood into union with himself. There is therefore no longer a great gulf fixed. On the contrary, there's a marvelous union. The Godhead has entered into marriage bonds with manhood. O oh my soul, do not stand like a poor, lonely orphan wailing across the deep sea after your father who has gone far away and cannot hear you. You do not sob and sigh like an infant left naked and helpless, its creator having gone too far away to regard its wants or listen to its cries. No, your creator has become like yourself. Is that too strong a word to use? He who created all things and him whom all things are held together is that same word who lived for a while among us and was made flesh, and made flesh in such a way that he was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. O oh, mankind, was there ever such good news as this for you? Inferior mankind, you weak worm of the dust, far lower than the angels, lift up your head and don't be afraid. Inferior mankind, born in weakness, living a life of work and stress, covered with sweat, and then dying only to be eaten by the worms, don't you be ashamed, even in the presence of heaven's highest ranking angels, for next to God is man, and not even an archangel stands in position between God and man. No, not next to God. There is an absolute, complete union between God and man, 
for Jesus, who is God, is also man. Jesus Christ, eternally God, was born and lived as we also do. That is the first word of comfort to expel our fear. It's beautiful. God has come near to us in Jesus Christ, and he's come near to you today.